Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar, uh, again, organized by the Society of Medical Radiographers, Malta. Um, this is our second webinar of this series. Uh, the aim of this series of webinars is to celebrate Radiography Month. And again, we aim to share research, so share some lectures, uh, and hope to promote some discussions that are relevant to our profession. Uh, today we have some special guests, as they are brand new, uh, the brand new generation of radiographers. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate them and their colleagues for completing uh, their studies on behalf of SRM. All three presenters today, um, Ms. Sharon Gatt, Ms. Narel Vella and Mr. Robert Pisani, will be presenting the result research done as part of their radiography degree. <laughs> uh, as you know, SRM supports all research done by students and professionals. Uh, as such, we truly appreciate that you accepted to present here. Um, to all the attendees, as last time, we strongly uh, encourage everyone to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, you can ask questions even during the presentations using the chat. Um, we will be reading this this questions at the end when we finish um, and um, and please please do present questions uh, without any further ado I think I'm going to introduce the first panelist Miss Sharon Cat she will pre be presenting on optimization of the AP abdomen, abdomen projection in large patients thank you Sharon for presenting and um, well done on your studies and good luck for your presentation Thank you, Guilherme, for your very nice introduction. Um, I will share my screen in a second. So, good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to start by first thanking SRM for this opportunity. Um, my study for the dissertation project in my final year of studies is, was entitled The Optimization of the AP Abdomen Projection in Large Patients. Um, in this presentation, we'll go through a brief background, a justification for the study, the aim, methodology, results, and discussion. Uh, so we'll start with a brief background. So radiographers are daily faced with challenges when imaging larger patients. These could include identifying bony anatomical landmarks, ensuring good positioning and beam centering, and selecting the appropriate exposure parameters to achieve images of optimal image quality. Uh, as we all know, the appropriate selection of exposure parameters in accordance with the patient's thickness is key in determining the quality of the resultant image. That is, the resultant image is neither under nor overexposed. Both under and overexposed images may result in images which are not suitable for diagnosis, which may necessitate a repeat radiograph and sequating to unnecessary dose to the patient. As for justification for this study, uh, when considering that 69.75% of the Maltese population are either in the overweight or obese range, local radiographers are likely to encounter such patients in their daily practice. Firstly, however, it is important that we define what large patients are. So the World Health Organization classifies the population into four main categories according to BMI measurements. These are underweight, normal, overweight, and obese, with the BMI ranging from 18.5 or less for underweight, between 18.5 and 24.9 for normal, between 25 and 29.9 for overweight, and greater than 30 for obese. Throughout the years, there have been various studies which were conducted to correlate specific BMI to specific patient measurements, including the anteroposterior AP abdominal diameter. A recent study correlating BMI to anteroposterior AP abdominal diameter measurements showed that an AP abdominal diameter of 22.3 uh, centimeters correlates to a BMI of 28.6. This BMI value falls within the overweight range, and hence an AP abdominal diameter of 22.3 would correlate to an overweight patient. However, although a lot of studies have been conducted, further research is still required in establishing the correlation of space specific patient measurements to optimization of diagnostic procedures. Um, and having said so, this study aimed to identify the optimal exposure parameters for different abdominal thicknesses in large patients. Hence, 
optimizing the AP abdomen projection in large patients in terms of radiation dose and image quality. Once the aim has been identified, we can move on to the methodology. So the methodology for the study was composed of two main phases, phase one and phase two. For phase one, a 2018 Fujifilm polyfunctional X-ray unit, as we can see in the image here, was used to radiograph an anthrop a PB of 50 anthropomorphic whole body fentanyl. The simulation of different sizes of patients which was achieved by placing one centimeter thick layers of commercially available fat known as lard, cut and wrapped in simple plastic and placed onto the anterior aspect of the phantom. Firstly, a reference image was taken of the phantom using the standard protocol for the standard sized patients and with the parameters that was used are depicted in this table here. So the parameters used for the reference image were an AP abdominal diameter of the phantom only with no, with no additional light, which was of 20 centimeters, using a KVP setting of 80, maximum collimation, centering along the mid-sagittal plane, equidistant from each anterior superior ilex spine at the level of the iliac crest, all three ASA chambers used, the AP abdominal algorithm, an SSE of 100 centimeters, and finally an anti-scatter grid was also used. Following this, so after the uh, reference image was taken, a total of 20 experimental images were taken, with five images taken for every five centimeter thickness of light added to the phantom, resulting in four different AP abdominal thicknesses. 20 centimeters, which, which was the phantom only with no additional light, 25 centimeters, five layers additional light, 30 and 35 as you can also see in this table here. So the images were taken across a range of KVP settings, ranging from 8 to 120 KVP at 10 KVP intervals. And following this, the resultant relative dose was measured in terms of depth and MAS. Phase 2 was then composed of the objective image quality evaluation and the subjective image quality evaluation of the resultant images. So for the objective image quality evaluation, this involved the calculation of SNR and CNR. So for the calculation of SNR and CNR, two regions of interest situated on the lower left lobe and the lower right lobe of the liver, which can be seen as red circles in this image, were selected as the signal, while another two are always seen as the yellow circles in this, in this image here were selected on the background areas as noise. From these ROIs, um, there were equations that was used to calculate the SNR and the CNR for every image, and the regions of interest were kept constant for every image, both in shape and size. As for the subjective image quality evaluation, this involved the absolute visual grading analysis by five radiographers and four radiologists. The participants used a quality scoring tool to grade the images based on the visualization of four anatomical criteria. The criteria were graded on a five-point Likert scale. One indicated that the criterion is not visualized and five meaning that the criterion was visualized. Uh, the VGC curve, visual grading characteristic curves, were plotted from the absolute VGA scores, and there's an example of a VGC curve right here, and this, these graphs compare the image quality of one radiograph against the other. The difference in image quality between the two radiographs on the VGC curve is assessed by calculating the area under the curve. The images were displayed in a random order using ViewDeck software, as can also be seen here, where the image is displayed alongside the four anatomical criteria. Also, with the exposure parameters used for that specific, um, for the specific image not shown to the participants. Um, now that the methodology has been done, all, all, once all that was done, we moved on to the results, which is obviously the most important part. So the results were split into radiation dose and combined objective and subjective image quality evaluation. So um, for radiation dose, the graphs below show the variation of depth and MAS with increasing abdominal thickness and variance in KVP settings. So as the fat from these graphs, it was uh, shown that as fat, thickness, as fat thickness increased, both depth and MAS increased linearly across all tube potentials. So, sorry, my mistake. So as an example here, the MAS at 80 kVp, but with no additional lard, um, was at 6.3 MAS. However, this increased by 419% over here to 32.7 MAS at 80 kVp, but with 15 centimeters thickness of light added. The second set of results were the combined objective and subjective image quality evaluation. So uh, the images were selected depending on whether there was a significant change on in subjective and objective image quality. So for the objective image quality, thresholds for changes in CNR and SNR 
were adapted from the General Electric QA Phantom User Manual for CT. This user manual indicated that contrast in an image should not vary by more than 12, and spatial resolution should not vary by more than 4 from the baseline. If CNR and SNR varied by more than 12 and 4 respectively from the baseline values, this meant that there was a significant change in objective image quality for that image. Baseline values were the ones acquired for the reference image. As for the subjective image quality, an AUC value was obtained for each criterion, for each KVP setting and every thickness. This was compared to the AUC 0.5 value indicating equivalent image quality using a one-sample t-test. If the p-value obtained from the one-sample t-test is less than 0.05, this indicates a significant change in subjective image quality. And now we'll take a look at the results for the four different thicknesses and which KVP setting and exposure parameters were optimal uh, for each thickness. So for the first thickness, which was the thickness of the phantom only, 20 centimeters, uh, we found that there was no significant difference in subjective image quality between the images taken at 90, 100, and 110 KVP. Bet between 90, 100, 110, and 120 KVP. However, the thresholds for SNR at 120 KVP um, were exceeded because SNR varies by more than four. Therefore, the image at 110 KVP was selected because both subjective and objective image quality are sustained. Furthermore, and the most important part, the dose delivered at 110 KVP decreased by 56.5% for depth and by 76.2% for MAS from the reference image. Moving on to the second thickness, which was thickness 25 centimeters, uh, we've seen that there was no significant difference in subjective image quality between the reference image and the image and the images at 90, 100, and 110 KVP. Both subjective and objective image quality were not sustained at 120 KVP, as we can see here. Hence, the image at 120 KVP was excluded, and the image at 110 KVP was selected because both subjective and objective image quality um, are sustained as well. And furthermore, the dose delivered at 110 KVP decreased by 54.2% for depth and by 736 for MAS. Moving on to the third thickness, uh, which was thickness 30 centimeters, the phantom plus 10 centimeters added layers of lard, we found that there was no significant difference between the image, between the reference image and the images taken at 90, 100, and 110 KVP. The image at 120 KVP showed a significant difference in, in subjective image quality. This was therefore excluded, and the image at 110 KVP. At this, at this KVP, both objective and subjective image quality are sustained, and the dose delivered at 110 KVP decreased by 29.2% for depth and 59.7% for MAS from the reference image. And lastly, for the last thickness, which was thickness 35 centimeters, uh, we found that there was no significant difference between the reference image and the image between and images taken at 90, 100, and 120 KVP. The image taken at 110 KVP showed a significant difference in subjective image quality uh, and therefore was excluded. The image at 120 KVP sustained both objective and subjective image quality and the dose was reduced by 50.7% for depth and 73.4% for MAS. So once all the results have been uh, concluded and added together, um, the, it it could be concluded and discussed that the results highlight the importance of tailoring exposure parameters according to individual patient measurements to maximize the optimization of radiography of the abdomen in large patients. So the main two points uh, from this study were that the research this where that increasing the KVP from 80 to 110 in patients with an AP abdominal diameter between 20 and 30 centimeters achieves significant dose reductions in both depth and MAS while still maintaining diagnosis. And increasing the KVP from 80 to 120 in patients with an AP abdominal diameter between 30 and 35 centimeters also resulted in significant dose reductions while still obtaining images that could be used for diagnostic purposes. Furthermore, um, as the thickness of the abdomen increased, there was an apparent decrease in both subjective and objective image quality levels, which could be expected due to an anticipated increase in the production of scatter, which negatively impacts image quality. One method which has been proposed of overcoming the poor penetrating ability of X-ray photons is to increase the KVP setting, a method which has been shown to have a negative impact on image quality.
However, for this study, this increase in KVP for larger thicknesses of the abdomen was beneficial because although it might result in a decrease in subjective and objective image quality, this increase in KVP could still result in diagnostically sound images coupled with a decrease in radiation dose in terms of depth and MAS. So uh, to conclude, after a thorough analysis, this guide is being presented with the optimal exposure parameters for radiography of the AP abdomen projection in large patients with the different thicknesses of the abdomen, the different KVP settings, and the corresponding MAS. And that was basically the results of my study. These are some references. Thank you for your attention. Well done. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. I think it was uh, really nice and it was really clear. Uh, and I think it shows how much work you've done. We're going to do the questions at the end, so we, we address all at the same time, sure. uh, if that's okay for you. Of course, thank and you very much. Thank you, thank you from our side, actually. Um, I'm going to pass on and I'm going to introduce then the second presenter. It's Miss Narelle Vella. Uh, she's going to be presenting about the awareness of ITU nursing staff and care workers on X-ray radiation and radiation protection. Okay. Narelle, feel free to share your screen. And uh, well done for your work. And... Uh, good luck for your presentation. Thank you, and good evening to everyone. So, as William already said, I'm going to be presenting my research study, and this was done together with Dr. Borchmina and Mr. Pierre So, a little introduction. So, as I'm sure you all know, the ITU takes care of takes care of patients who are in critical condition. And this requires the cooperation and teamwork of several different professionals, which include the radiographers and the nursing staff. And the nurses often have more information about the patient's condition and therefore are able to guide the radiographers during a mobile extra procedure. Uh, a study done in 2014 actually shows that both under and over production may result in a risk to both the patients and the other healthcare staff. So there was one aim to the study and the aim was to investigate the awareness of ITU nursing staff and care workers working in a stage in a hospital on the principles of X-ray radiation and radiation protection. And in order to reach the same, there were three objectives. So the first one was to determine the awareness of the ITU nursing staff and care workers on the principle of X-ray radiation and radiation protection through the use of a self-designed questionnaire. The second was to determine whether participant demographics have an effect on the level of awareness. And the third was to identify information sources that participants use and whether or not they would like to obtain more information on the topic. So the methodology. So the research design was prospective, descriptive, cross-sectional, non-experimental, and quantitative with some qualitative aspects. So the target population was all the staff nurses, nursing aides, and care workers working in the IT at the time. Uh, the situation might have changed, so there are probably more nurses. However, this was done in February, so that's the information I have. And basically, the eligibility criteria were healthcare professionals who work as nursing staff or care workers who were working in the ITU during the data collection period and who voluntarily consented to participate. The research tool was a self designed questionnaire, and it was made up of six sections with a total of 14 questions. The questions were mainly close-ended, however, some left space for the participants to write their own opinions, and there was one open-ended question. Uh, before using the tool, it was important to check that the results obtained are correct, and therefore validity testing and reliability testing were done. Uh, for validity testing, two experts were asked to rate the questionnaire, and uh, they rated each question, and some changes were made after the first rating. By the end of the process, there was a 92.5% um, score, which was very good. So we could move on a little bit more. Then for the reliability, the retest, the test retest method was chosen. And basically, the intermediary was asked to distribute a total of four coded questionnaires to four potential participants. 
the participants had content and fill in the questionnaire and give it back to the intermediary. After a period of two weeks, the intermediary redistributed the same copy of the questionnaire to the same participants. And the average score was found to be 0.5. So then data collection occurred and data collection started in mid-February. The plan was to continue until end of March. However, due to the situation, it ended up being four weeks rather than six. In order to analyze the data, the software IBM SPSS was used and the chi square twist was used for any correlations. And the limitations of the study are basically that a small sample size was obtained and questionnaires present a drawback that the questions might be misinterpreted. However, in order to limit this, while the study was done and validity and reliability were also done. Uh, Closed-ended questions also do not allow participants to elaborate. However, there was some space for them to add their own opinions in order to limit this. Ethical considerations. So before commencing the study, uh, permission was obtained from both REC and UREC, and participants were given a letter. This letter basically stated that participation is anonymous, that participants um, can voluntarily choose to complete, or they could choose not to complete it with no repercussions, and they could withdraw their consent at any point. So now the results. So out of a total of 109 potential participants, 42 participants gave back the questionnaire. So this is around 38.5%. So we can see that the majority of the participants were nurses, and the majority were females. We can also see in the second image that the majority were nurses. Um, another study done in 2015 by Amin Sampong et al. basically shows the same idea, so that there were predominantly female nurses who were the participants. And those authors justify this by claiming that healthcare professions generally attract more females. Another study in 2016 by Lindsay et al. also reported a similar finding and agreed with this justification. So when asked questions regarding their awareness on radiation protection, the results were as strong. So 26 participants stated that some types of radiation could be potentially harmful, and 36 participants identified X-ray radiation as a type of ionizing radiation. And the graph shows the responses for this question. So although most participants selected X-rays and gamma rays as being ionizing, some also selected the option radio waves and microwaves. And this also occurred in another study by Amin Sampong in 2015 that stated that 41.9% and 46.5% respectively thought that radio waves and microwaves were also a form of ionizing radiation. So uh, on, regarding the awareness of the mobile X-ray radiation procedure, so 35 participants correctly indicated that the radi that radiation is present when the radiographer pulls out exposing and that beep is sound. However, and further to that, in 32 participants, so 80%, selected the option saying that the patient is not radioactive. However, the remaining 20% stated that the patient is radioactive following a procedure, uh, mobile X-ray procedure. However, they said that it is okay for the healthcare professional to stay in the education. So this was also found by Lund in 2016, where 42.6% of the participating nurses believe that objects in a room emit radiation following an exposure. The same study also found that 41.5% of participants indicated that they did not enter the area after X-ray exposure has occurred. And that could be very worrying and troublesome for the patient care. So, understanding radiation protection principles. So, when asked whether or not it is possible to protect oneself from radiation, from extra radiation, 38 participants, so 95%, indicated that it is possible. And the second question then asked the patients, uh, the participants, on the various methods that would be adopted. And these were the results. So most participants chose the select 
the correct option. However, one participant selected the incorrect option, which was uh, by decreasing the distance between the X-ray machine and oneself. So when asked regarding their preferred information sources, uh, most participants selected radio buffers as being the most common source of information and selected lectures as being the second. And then when asked which methods they would like to see used in the future, they selected online sources and lectures as being the top. So about the correlation found, so the chi-square test was used and three correlations were found. And this was between the profession of the participants and their awareness of the radiations present, between the profession of the participants and the response to the question, how can one person one protect oneself from radiation? And the third one was between the gender of the participants and their awareness that protection from radiation is possible. So regarding the third one, 15% um, of the main participants responded incorrectly, whilst all of the females were, um, chose the correct answer. So this basically shows the first correlation. And we can see the majority is selected the correct answer. However, 32% of the nursing aides chose the correct one, and the same with the care workers. So that created a correlation. And the same in this case, the incorrect answer was chosen by someone working as a nurse aide. So in conclusion, and the results obtained in the study suggest that ITU nursing staff and care workers are aware of the principles of radiation protection. However, we're found to be less aware of the principles of extra radiation. And the participants expressed interest in obtaining further information. So some recommendations. Um, the introduction of short courses that provide and refresh information regarding these subjects. The introduction of Q&A sessions where all the concerns could be addressed in a safe way. And that the study may be repeated, and this may be repeated using a different tools, such as interviews, which could give more information on what the participants were thinking and why. And it may be done in different locations, such as different ones. Finally, as acknowledgments, the authors would like to thank the experts who validated the tool, the statistician, intermediary person and all the participants who took time out of their busy schedule to actually respond to the question. Some references and thank you all for your attention. Well done, Narelle. Uh, another great presentation. Thanks a lot for accepting to present here and, and for your great work. Thank you. I'm going to pass then to the third, uh, last but not the least presenter, Mr. Robert Pisani. Um, Robert is going to present about the effect of patient separation on acute gastrointestinal toxicities following radiotherapy for prostate cancer. Again, thank you a lot for presenting. Uh, well done for your work and good luck. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Now today I'm going to talk to you about our research, which was titled, as you can see, the effect of patient separation on acute gastrointestinal toxicities following radiotherapy for prostate cancer. So I'm going to dive right in. The aim was to determine whether patient separation has any effect on the acute GI radiation toxicities, also known as side effects. This was specific to VMAT radiotherapy for prostate cancer. Now, in the study, we used the terms severity and incidence. So, to define these simply, incidence was defined as when the side effects increase between the follow-up and the baseline. Moreover, severity was defined as the extent by which the baseline and follow-up scores increase. The more severe side effects would uh, reflect with a greater discrepancy between the baseline and follow-up. So apart from the separation and side effects and specifically the GI toxicities, we also examined the confounding factors which most commonly affect patients. These include the erectile dosimetry, 
patient age at diagnosis, and the lymph node inclusion, specifically pelvic lymph nodes in the radiation field. So on a literature review, we wanted to find what is the effect of body hepatitis on the side effects. We found very conflicting results. Some said that the, the larger the patient is, the more side effects he or she will have. Some conflictingly said that the larger the patient, the less side effects, and some said that there's no significance and there's no effect between these two. Moreover, a minority of studies focused on specifically prostate cancer, alternatively focusing on other cancers such as gynecological. Moreover, a minority of studies used patient separation as the anthropometric measure. Therefore, this was an innovative way of measuring patient size. And also, a minority of studies use the EPIC tool. This is the Expanded Prostate Cancer Index Composite. Now, this tool is used locally in the Maltese Radio Therapy Center, and uh, it's a validated tool tested with a large randomly selected cohort of patients whose characteristics and demographics were re internationally representative. Therefore, this provided a, a useful and uh, a uh, already validated tool which we can use. Now, this figure illustrates what separation is. So very simply, the anterior posterior separation or AP separation refers to the distance between the front and back aspects of the patient. Lateral separation refers to the right and left sides, the, dis the distance between. And we collected both AP and lateral separation. Uh, in green, you can see the prostate, or I'll explain later on. However, this was what we saw for each patient. Now, our target population was local patients with localized prostate cancer with seminal vesicles included, obviously treated locally with VMAT. So we evaluated 120 patients in our target population. This was reduced to 96 patients after we incorporated the exclusion criteria. So 24 were excluded due to either incomplete EPIC forms, so we had no information regarding the side effects. They either did not receive any standard hormone therapy, they had a previous surgery to the prostate, such as a radical prostatectomy, and they had a hip prosthesis implanted. We excluded these since if these were present, such as a hip prosthesis or a previous surgery to the prostate, it would alter the treatment being received. Therefore, it would alter the side effects. Okay. So our research design was a non-experimental, retrospective, descriptive, and cross-sectional study. We collected mainly, as we discussed before, the EPIC scores, and this was done at two points. One at baseline, which was prior to starting radiotherapy, and at follow-up, which was approximately one week following radiotherapy was completed. This allowed us to compare the starting and finishing of the patient. Next, the patient separation, as I said, the, both AP and lateral separations were collected from the CDSM. This is the scan, which is done at the beginning of treatment to plan the actual radiotherapy. Moreover, the confounding factors we collected were the patient age at diagnosis, the pelvic lymph node radiation status, meaning whether or not they had actually lymph nodes included in the radiation field, and the dose to 80% of the rectum. So the separation was measured on the CDCM. The AP separation was measured in the patient's midline, and the lateral separation was measured by dissecting the prostate gland. This was measured as well at the level of the base of the prostate, since this represents the level at which the center of the field will be present. Content validity index and integrated reliability were also performed and were found to be excellent. And ethical approval was granted by the Faculty of Health Sciences Ethics Board. So, results. This table one shows the demographics of our study. So most of our patients were within the 71 to 75 year age group, and this was expected since prostate cancer is mainly diagnosed within a mean age of 72 years. Only six patients had lymph nodes. So this presented a small issue since uh, due to the small number of patients with lymph node radiation, it limited the generalization of results regarding lymph nodes. And this was a limitation that we acknowledged. The mean AP separation was 22.87 centimeters, and the mean lateral was 36.60. So a significant number of patients showed an increase in gastrointestinal toxicities from start to finish 
of radiotherapy. However, it was shown that these uh, side effects were all minor. So the severity was all minor, minimal. So, okay. So with regards to separation toxicities, neither incidence nor severity was shown to have any statistically significant relationship with the separations. This means that we cannot say with confidence that there is a difference in incidence or severity of GI side effects as a, as a result of patient separation. These PMI correlation between toxicity, severity, and the separations had non-significant p-values, as you can see there. And similarly, the cruz wallis test relating toxicity incidence and separation had non-significant p-values as well. Moreover, none of the confounding factors, age, lymph nodes, or rectal dissymmetry showed any significant relationship with the gastrointestinal toxicities. So why did we obtain these results? These results were mainly attributed to the VMAT technique. So VMAT stands for Volume Modulated Arc Therapy, and this is a relatively new, new technique in radiotherapy, which allows for an administration of a more conformal dose to the targets. Therefore, this reduces the dose to the sensitive organs at risk, i.e. the organs which are adjacent to the targets, but are healthy, so we would like to avoid them. Moreover, image-guided radiotherapy, specifically cone beam CT, is used locally, and this was also attributed to the results. So IGRT, or image guided radiotherapy, allows for further accuracy in the dose administration, and also has the added possibility of reduction in treatment margins, therefore limiting the dose to the sensitive organs at risk. So the inclusion of pelvic lymph nodes would actually increase the volume being treated. However, the tolerance to the rectum was still maintained for patients, and this would explain why there was no significant increase in toxicities observed. Moreover, speaking on the rectal dose, the rectal dosimetry showed no relation to side effects, and this is quite a strange result, since it would reason that the more dose you have the rectum, the higher the side effects. However, for all patients included in the study, the tolerance was within the tolerance, so the recommended dose was below 24.6, and all patients had a dose well below. Finally, with regards to patient age and diagnosis, uh, our study was in line with previous studies, and since there was no relationship observed. So to conclude, we cannot say that there is a significant relationship between AP or lateral separations with side effects. And these results are due to mainly VMAT and image-guided radiotherapy. So to conclude, the VMAT has a better conformity, so less side effects. Image guided therapy also has more accuracy, so less side effects. And this adds to the existing body of knowledge, agreeing with some studies while contradicting others. So some recommendations for future studies and for practice. So we, we recommended that a toxicity grading tool, as utilized in the study, such as the EPIC, should be used for all patients for all treatment sites, currently locally, the EPIC is used, used for prostate cancer. However, uh, lo both locally and abroad, there is a limit to the actual tools used. Um, there are a number of tools actually available, such as the CDCAE or the RTOG. You might have heard of them. However, these are not commonly used. And we believe that this would be beneficial for two reasons. One, for future studies, which can retrospectively look on these uh, tools, and also for patient care. If you monitor the patient using these tools, you'll know the side effects better and you can quantify them and you can treat them accordingly. So patient size should not influence any radiotherapy treatment provided. This was since we did not find any significant relationship between the separation or patient size and the gastrointestinal toxicities. Furthermore, patients receiving prostate cancer radiotherapy should receive similar care regardless of patient size. Finally, patients at the end of treatment showed more GI toxicities. Therefore, patient care should be emphasized in this phase of treatment specifically. So some limitations of our studies. So very few patients had lymph node radiation. This was, uh, as we discussed, only six patients had this. So this limited the evaluation of this factor. So this study could be repeated with a larger sample of patients who had lymph node radiation.
Next, the red flag was for you was orbit intolerance, i.e. a dose less than 24.6. So we only collected the dose to 80% of the rectum. A further study could be done, or this study could be repeated, which collects more dose for your parameters to the rectum, especially those which represent high dose areas. Next, only patient separation was used as the anthropometric measurement for patient size. So another study could actually use multiple measurements to assess if one is better than the other, and also to more produce more reliable results. So examples would be BMI, visceral fat, or waist circumference. Finally, the evaluation of patient size should be done on other side effects, such as the uh, urinary or cutane side effects, and on other anatomical areas and cancers. This would further add to the body of knowledge and therefore increase, improve, sorry, patient care. So some references. Thank you for your attention. You have my email on the screen if you need to contact me regarding any questions. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you for, for presenting your, your results.